Hello everyone and welcome to Saxworks. So happy to have you here in our beautiful space. We're at Saxworks Vesky right now. Uh, my name is Rachel Sklar. I'm the VP of Programming and Content here at Saxworks. We absolutely love our speakers. I love this speaker a lot and I will get to that in a moment. But first I want to tell you about our beautiful spaces. We have two spaces in New York, uh, here in Vesey and Brookfield Place, in our flagship Saxeth Avenue on the 10th floor, and one recently opened in Greenwich, Connecticut. We absolutely would love to see you in person and you can go to saxworks.com and sign up for a complimentary day pass and come see us in person. That is a win-win for everybody concerned, I think. And also, if you like plants, then you are in luck because <laughs> that, that is something we have in abundance. Um, also in abundance, amazing speakers. And today's speaker is one of my favorites. Uh, Ashley Brichter is the founder of Birth Smarter, which is a birth and, chi and, and post childbirth, I guess, new parent. Yeah. I, how am I forgetting this lingo already? <laughs> I have a child. Uh, <laughs> She's old now, though. She's out of it. Right? Um, uh, it, it is meant for parents and supporting communities, and there should be a supporting community, should not just be the mom. Am I right? You're right. Uh, she'll be explaining all of that <laughs> and much more gently because that's kind of her thing. Uh, I, I know, actually, what is that, that line, the Victor Kayam line? Like, I'm not just a fan, I'm a former customer. I'm paraphrasing yeah, right. Victor Kayam. Uh, Ashley was my doula and she figured out how to scale her amazing healing, supporting powers in uh, Birth Smarter, a wonderful, thriving company. Forbes, uh, what is it, Forbes 1000 companies to watch, mm -hmm. uh, amongst many other things. Anyhow, Ashley's amazing. She's going to talk to us today about finding opportunity amid overwhelm, which I know I've had an overwhelming week. It's kind of, I don't know, can you live in 2022 and not relate to that? So thank you, Ashley. I'm so happy to have you here at Saxworks. And uh, thank you for tuning in and thank you for coming. Great. Um, thank you, Rachel. Thank you everybody for being here virtually and in real life. Um, I think that the first thing is just like, it's a very vulnerable, casual conversation. Um, anytime we talk about overwhelm um, and there's a decent mix of people that know me and don't know me. So I'll do a little bit of a longer background in terms of why I'm talking about this and you know, why I think it might be relevant to you. Um, but I am, sort of like Rachel alluded to, no stranger to overwhelm. I don't think anybody is. And I, um, let's see, I am an educator. I think that's my biggest background. I really thought I would be in the public school world as a teacher for a long time. Um, coincidentally, through a long series of just, you know, opportunities, fell into the birth world. So I became a doula and a childbirth educator um, about 10 years ago. Um, and I turned that career supporting pregnant people and new parents um, into a business, which is Birth Smarter. And we provide practical wisdom and guidance to new and expectant parents. Um, our home base is here in New York, um, but we also teach virtually and lead support groups uh, for people all over the country. Um, and I'm born and raised in New York City. I'm, re I'm recently moved to Salt Lake City, Utah. Um, so this is a really nice opportunity to be home on like a very beautiful day in a very beautiful place. And I will say having seen Saxworks from afar and like this is my first time in the space, it is like very well worth the trip. Um, so everybody should come check it out. Um, and my identifying with the topic of overwhelm, um, I would say started in middle school. That's when I started like identifying the feeling, which if you reflect back to your, you know, adolescent years is probably true for everybody. Um, and the stories, there are sort of three core stories in my personal journey and my health journey um, that made me like hone in on this particular feeling. Um, so the first is when I was 12, so just put yourself in this situation, being 12, navigating your friendships. Um, I sort of woke up one day with warts, that's an interesting word to say, like all over my hands and feet and covered them in band-aids and was like, I don't know what's happening. This is 
gross. <laughs> like I went from being a perfectly fine, albeit awkward human to a like awkward human that now had this like physical condition that was going to like really separate me from my peer group at a very, very like heightened time in your life where that's important. Um, and did all of the things in allopathic medicine in order to get the warts to go away. Um, and nothing worked and they kept coming back. And so sort of started, um, you know, due to many people in my life and a lot of care and intelligence and support, found a doctor that was able to, in this case, with homeopathic medicine, help my warts go away comprehensively. Um, I learned nothing from that experience. <laughs> <laughs> Fast forward to my junior year of high school, I was, I think, very much classified then as an overachiever, which some of you also might identify with. Um, and I was applying to colleges and writing essays and doing all the things that people do and volunteering for all the things and trying to be that person that could qualify for college by having a resume that was like unreasonably long. Um, and I came home one day and I had hit a point of exhaustion as a young teenager that it didn't make any sense for me. Um, and I fell asleep on the sofa and I woke up five hours later with 105 fever. And we went to the emergency room and we were sorting out what mysterious illness I had developed. And after a number of weeks, it turned out to be nothing. Again, learned very little from that experience. <laughs> um, my senior year of college, I was still a little bit in this overachiever vibe, really trying to make my life work and fit. Um, and I was both pursuing writing a thesis um, and student teaching full time in Philadelphia, uh, pursuing my career in education. Um, while having a long distance relationship and being the captain of a sports team and having friendships and, um, and I gained a lot of weight in a very short amount of time. And again, woke up one morning and my warts came back. And I was like, this is a thing. <laughs> like I'm 10 years sort of past the original incidents. Um, I think I should pay attention to what's happening. And coincidentally was able to find that original doctor that I went to in middle school. And I called her up and I said, you don't remember me. I was a 12 year old girl in your office and you made my warts go away and I need that medicine that you gave me. And she said, okay, tell me what's happening in your life. And at the time, I had no experience with therapy or anything other than people in my life really liked me and I had friends and I talked to them. And I sort of unloaded my life onto her for an hour. And she said, great, I'm gonna put something in the mail. When it comes, take one pill and call me two weeks later. And I waited every day, I like ran to the mailbox at my college. You know, I was like, when is this coming? Like the warts are so yucky to me. And I think we all have our metaphorical version of whatever that is, that thing that you just like really like don't want anybody to notice or see. Um, and so they came and I opened it up and I literally, I like, it was so frantic. I like took this pill and I was like, it's magic. It's going to work right away. Um, and I went home and I sat down and I looked at it and not in huge writing, but like decently <laughs> visible on the package was, this is a homeopathic anti-anxiety. And it was the first time I had ever been reflect, I had ever had the term anxiety reflected back on me. And I think that now, right, we have like a very mixed aged audience here. So the younger ones, I'm gonna assume have like, you know what that word is. People have explained to you that like anxiety is when you have this feeling of like, I can't manage or cope with what's happening. I feel worried, I feel nervous. If you are on the older side of the audience, that probably was never brought up. And I'm in a little bit of a middle generation that was like, I don't know what this is and now I'm learning, right? So that moment in time took 10 years of my like, my health and my well-being and just like sort of pushed it through this funnel of my body has been telling me what I need to pay attention to for years and I didn't know how to listen to it. I didn't know what I was looking for. And I felt so lucky to have not only the opportunity to learn this lesson, but also a diversity of perspectives in my life in order to find the help that I needed at the time. 
And so I sort of like took this lesson and I didn't know what to do with it other than like tell people this weird story of like I had warts when I was in middle school. Um, and it turned into through being a teacher and being a doula and starting a business and, and helping myself and then helping a lot of different people move through challenges in their life. Um, a way to say, I think when you're doing something really hard, you should pay attention to the parts that are really challenging for you because there's an opportunity in that moment for you to learn a lesson that's going to help you move forward, not just sort of stay steady and survive what we're doing right now. Um, and the time that I like got to practice this was really when I worked as a doula and now in our collective, another birth martyr, you know, friend has come to join us in our collective, we're gonna help you have a baby. And some of you have had babies, some of you haven't yet, some of you never will. The point of learning this lesson from childbirth isn't that you have to have a baby in order to understand it, but those of us who have had children, I have two, they're wonderful. Um, there is nothing more challenging than having a human being inside your body get out. There is nothing more challenging than that. And it doesn't matter how, what, what part of your body that baby comes out of. It doesn't matter how you move through that experience. That is the most challenging thing. It's also the most universal human experience because we were all born. We came out of somebody's body, right? So the person that had us went through that and that shapes who we are. And not, his, not forever, but in our world right now, people are mostly really freaked out about having babies. And I think we can extrapolate that into people are sort of freaked out to do something really hard because we don't really want to. <laughs> like, I want my life, I want my experiences, I want my work, I want my relationships to just feel a little bit easier. I want them to stay in a box where I'm in charge and in control and I know the boundaries. And doing something like having a baby pushes you into an unknown that kicks up a whole lot of fear. And I have made a career out of teaching people how to embrace that. Um, and we do that through four really simple things. We have to really dissect and understand the problem in front of us. We need to like look at it physiologically, scientifically, as much of a neutral observer as possible. Put that on a piece of paper and see what it is. What's the conflict in front of you? The second thing you have to do is understand the societal context that you're living in because that piece of paper in Germany or South Africa or Ghana or the United States or New York downtown versus uptown, wherever we are in the world, whatever year it is, whatever pandemic there is or war there is or economic system we're a part of is going to affect how somebody can tackle that challenge, right? Then we have to understand our personal context. This room of people is filled with somebody at different ages, different races, different socioeconomic statuses, right? Our, I'm very much in the Encanto world of parenting right now, so like intergenerational trauma is gonna kick up stuff for all of us that's really unique and different. And so what we bring to the table when we're trying to navigate conflict is going to be different, right? And so the last step is once we understand the conflict, once we understand the societal context, once we understand our personal context, we get to create a roadmap for how we want to go forward and face this challenge, informed by the other three things together, right? The other thing that I think helps tremendously when you have this framework is one of the biggest things that comes up for me when I think about overwhelm, and I'm giving you an answer to a question I'm gonna ask, so if you're paying attention, you'll be great in three or four minutes. But um, one of the biggest things that comes up for me when I'm overwhelmed that I think is universal is a feeling of comparing yourself to others or comparing yourself to a standard that you think exists in the world, right? When you understand a problem, a societal context and a personal context, 
everything is non-judgmental because your particular recipe, your particular flavor, the input of how you're gonna solve that challenge is not the same as anybody else's. And therefore how you tackle it is not gonna be the same as anybody else. Okay, so all that said, <laughs> um, I do wanna think about overwhelm a little bit and make it more interactive because as Yoko really knows, like I can't talk for so long without pulling in from everybody. Um, so we have a really small worksheet that we'll give people here. If anybody is watching the recording, these are really simple questions. If you take a piece of paper and a pen, you can think about it. Um, but I think that the way that this framework is valuable is by workshopping it a little bit. Um, so the first question to think about is just, what is overwhelm? And that's not gonna have a right answer, right? So it's important to practice exercises that don't have a right answer. Um, but I think there's room up here. Yeah, like one of these sofas. Um, so, so there's no right answer, but just do a free association of when you hear the word overwhelm, what, what other words come to mind? What do you think about? Either what does it feel like or um, what do you associate it with? Busy. Hmm? Busy. Busy. So we'll take a second to write. Try for three to five words. If you have more, that's awesome, but that's your goal. Three to five words for what is overwhelm. Jot it down um, and then we'll do a, we'll find out what people think. <laughs> Actually, while you're in the world of writing, just go ahead to the second question as well, which is, what are the triggers for your overwhelm? Right? Again, it doesn't have to be true for anybody else, just you. So you thought a little bit about what overwhelm means, and then in your life, what social conditions, environmental conditions, political conditions sort of would indicate that you know you're going to be overwhelmed soon. Or when you are overwhelmed, what's around you that's making it happen? For those watching the live stream, uh, I will tweet that out right now. <laughs> Rachel, I feel like we need pictures of everybody like working so well. This is such a studious group. <laughs> it's like so since people are so sincerely answering questions. No, we can't. Okay. We can't. Baby's gonna, would you like snap a picture of this, this workshopping? There's just like collective thinking happening. That's great. Okay. All right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to um, look for, for participation. So Yoko said already, one of the things that came to mind with overwhelm is busyness. Um, what else? In your free association, what is overwhelm to you? Too much. Too much. Mm -hmm. No time for yourself. No time for yourself. Okay. Yeah. Ah, yeah, that feeling of like, yeah. Yes. Yes. Being trapped in a person of your own making. I also just want to just that first part, right? That feeling of being trapped, like I'm stuck, right? So I'm stuck. There's definitely an element maybe of your own making. Sometimes there is, sometimes there isn't, right? It's going to depend. Yeah. I can't remember. I don't have time for myself. So what else does it feel like? What else do we associate with overwhelm? 
lack of air, that stuckness, right? Claustrophobia, I can't, I can't even go forward or move. Okay, so what are the, yeah? Unsupported or isolated. Yes, yeah, unsupported or isolated. Okay, so that is such a good bridge into the triggers, right? Because I feel like that is an environmental condition when you don't have enough support around you. Um, what other triggers are there? What, what are the other conditions that make our overwhelm come up? <laughs> Disorganized. Yeah. Yeah, what was yours? challenges that life throws at me and then just because I have to accept them and try to deal with them and then I'm overwhelmed. So like, so, so, okay, so the statement is when you accept the challenges life throws at you and then you feel overwhelmed and so the alternative to that could be like being more discerning about what you take on, right? Yeah, okay, so just like accepting, saying yes to everything. Yep, yeah, not having boundaries or protecting our own time or energy, okay. Other conditions for being overwhelmed? Yeah. Lack of communication. Yes, lack of communication. Okay, so lack of communication, lack of like protecting our boundaries and our time, feeling disorganized or being disorganized. Yeah, yeah. That sense of responsibility. Yeah. And so much of that is like future projecting, right? Like I'm not in the present with my choice. I'm like trying to solve so many more problems and like think ahead to like what else is going to happen. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes. So I think that's also, somebody said like just a lotness, right? So then one of the conditions is when there are a lot of things in different areas, right? Like if personal things, if global things, political things are coming at you at the same time. Yep. Yeah. Are you asking for what triggers my overwhelm? Yeah. I think that that's so well said and one for me as well, which is when many people need you, right? And you have to show up more for others than for yourself. Yeah, totally. <laughs> uh -huh, I see you, I see it, I feel it. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so, so we can identify this problem collectively. It's gonna look different for all of us, but the problem is, we're really busy, we have a lot on our plate, we feel like we can't breathe or we're trapped, and we feel this way when there's too much coming our way, we're not protecting our own time, we don't have boundaries, we're really trying to like help other people more than ourselves. Um, yeah, okay, so we see it, right? <laughs> Why is it bad? Like in and of itself, I see that problem, but what does it prevent you from doing or being or feeling that makes it something that you want to avoid? Does that question make sense? Yeah. Like when you get overwhelmed, your brain stops. Yeah. You, you get to capacity. Yep. Yeah. So, so the way I see that is like when we are in a tricky situation physiologically, most people think about fight or flight, right? Um, and what I think is what, what is known sort of sociologically is missing from that is it's actually fight, flight or freeze. And a lot of people don't, 
know that they can identify with that freeze component. Um, and that is, I think, what you're saying, what happens to me as well, which is I'm not in fight or flight. I'm just in like a, I'm going to shut down for a second and regroup. My mom calls it the fainting go moment. <laughs> like when she gets really overwhelmed. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh huh. Like when the turkey showed up, I had all these people and the turkey, my oven broke in the middle of the turkey at Thanksgiving, and everyone was like, What do we do? And I was like, Oh, no. I don't know. I just need to just, we can't think right now, no, we don't. We just need to hide. Like, that's literally what we have to do. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it won't work out, but I literally was like, I have no idea. But, okay, so this is such a good example, right? Holidays. <laughs> like, it's such a great example because you're trying, especially when you're hosting, right? You're trying to please all these other people. The stakes feel really high because of some, like, weird cultural, like, thing that we have around holidays being the time that everything has to be so perfect. And um, there's no boundaries in that. and it's urgent, right? There's like an urgency that like, this is it. This is the chance we get. And if we mess it up, <laughs> one, we have to mess it up. Like it's messed up for a whole year until we can redo. But then also for parents, it's like, this is what I'm passing on, right? <laughs> like your whole identity as a being is wrapped up in this turkey. So um, yeah, maybe like some, some outrageous projecting that we're doing. Um, okay, so it, I think what, what we're saying is like it just prevents us from having that sense of calm that we want in our life and it prevents you from accomplishing whatever it is you wanted to accomplish. Right? Now I'm like in this frozen state. So, so I'll say two more things. One is, um, <laughs> one is that the core concept here of like how do we look for opportunities is only relevant when like our basic needs are met. There are situations that are legitimate urgencies or state of emergencies, that's not overwhelm, right? So if there's actually something really catastrophic happening, then you need to be in survival mode and don't like put any pressure on yourself to be like, oh, I went to this talk <laughs> and I really wanna like see the, over I wanna see the opportunity here and how can I make myself a better person? Like we get to live in a state of emergency and reflect on it later. Um, so, so that's one. And the other is that, oh, I think I lost my train of thought. Well, it'll come back or it wasn't that important. Um, okay. So the next question for you, just in terms of self-reflection is what do you bring to the table? Right? So on your worksheet, which Rachel tweeted, um, there's a little box for context. And just three to five things that come to mind in terms of who you are in your life or what's happening in the world that are gonna shape right now how you're gonna move through overwhelming moments. So it could be you know, your age, it could be how much money you have, it could be any of the number of you know, ha global headlines, whatever is like jumping out at you is like, this is a thing that is affecting how I move through the world right now. Yeah. And it's okay if you don't do this exercise, if it doesn't feel useful for you, you can do whatever makes sense. <laughs> Um, this is a more personal question, so nobody has to share, but does anybody want to throw out one or two pieces of your context? Yeah. I know I love it. <laughs>
Yeah. 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 Okay. Fear. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And then not being someone that, you know, is earning millions of dollars. Yeah. Like, trust me, it's like, oh, where did it go wrong? You know, yeah. Where did, where did this train come off the track? So, you know, um, that's kind of, you know, where the, the only one that we can focus on is domains. Yeah. And I mean, I think like pulling the money and debt thing into that, like, okay, we're, you know, many of us in this room were raised as, as academic overachievers in capitalism. And the way that you win at capitalism is you make a lot of money. And so we've lost, <laughs> um, some of us have lost. And, and so what does that mean? Like as we move through the world as somebody that tried really hard to play the game, right? And we haven't won or we haven't won yet. Um, and capitalism is going to do a really good job of telling us to keep playing, um, right? Because they make money the more you play. Um, so that's a really tricky societal context to navigate. And one I think is, is being questioned a lot at the moment, which is interesting, but we don't have an alternative just yet. Yeah, parenting status. Yes. Yes. Feels high yes. Every every decision to come here. Yeah. Is one that I had to consciously make. Yes. Consideration, their potential. Yeah. That's that's a reality. It's a reality, right? Your physical health and well-being and the physical health and well-being of the people around you is a huge reality and one that has heightened many of our emotional states for two and a half years. Yeah. No, I'm, I'm saying, so like in, when I do the list, right, my personal context, it can be down to like, I'm getting my period tomorrow, right? And so where I'm at in my cycle is part of my personal context. Um, you know, going on and off of medication is part of my personal context. My health history in general is part of my personal context. And I think that when we again, because we're operating in such a limited world view of what it means to win and what it means to be successful, that there's no room for the nuances, right? But when we make room for the nuances of where we're at in the moment, sometimes overwhelm and finding the opportunity and moving through it is as simple as, I'm getting my period, I'm gonna deal with this next week. I'm gonna have so much more energy next week. That's when I'm gonna tackle this problem. And instead of taking three days to be like, I can't figure it out, put it on the calendar for Wednesday, and then you'll like tackle it in two hours, right? So it, it takes an extraordinary amount of self-reflection, self-observation and awareness in order to tackle the problems at the time it makes sense, right? Or if one of our triggers, let's say around, you know, something like Thanksgiving dinner is being around certain people, we get to create an environment in which we tackle certain problems at that time and not others. Okay, so um, there's so much more that we could say about all of these individual things and they're all different talks and conversations, but in order to get to like our roadmap, um, if you turn the page over, my like very oversimplified acronym <laughs> to, give you a, uh, to give you a framework to think about is, um, okay, so I, we were joking earlier that this is my emotional support water bottle, right? I feel like a toddler that has a blankie that I need to take with me everywhere. And the reason is there was a water bottle in a cup here next to me, which is so thoughtful. Thank you, everybody at Saxworks for giving me water. Um, but the act of having to pick up a cup 
and take a sip and drink is like very different for me than just having a straw. It's so, it's so simple and I think it just comes from years of being a doula and like needing somebody to take a sip and having no barrier to hydration. If there's any barrier to hydration, when you're having a labor contraction, you're not gonna take a sip of water. That's an outrageous thought. I have no extra energy to tilt my head back. <laughs> um, and so like this is my hack for making my life as simple as possible. Um, and so I'm obsessive about hydration. So your, your acronym is about taking a sip, right? Anytime you're stressed, you take a sip of water. And sip in this context is going to be three things. One is getting the support that you need. One is having an active imagination. And the other is giving yourself permission. And we can talk this through. Love. It came to me in a dream. <laughs> um, like Rachel's birthday, apparently, it came to me in a dream. <laughs> um, so I think we already addressed how isolation is one of the conditions where most of us do feel overwhelmed. Because part of that a lotness, that stuckness, really does come from feeling over from feeling alone or isolated. And support can look all different ways. Um, so we can go into what, what that means for you. Is it actually having a thought partner? Is it having somebody just sit next to you but be quiet? Right? Is, what does that mean? How much support? What sort of support? Are you paying for it? Is it, you know, a friend? But, but you generally are going to need other people with you. Um, and that's a human need. It's also goes back to interrupting capitalism a little bit because we do have a very individ individualistic society that tells us that we need to solve these problems alone and that we are best when we're really individualistic, right? I don't need anybody. And actually not needing anybody is a coping strategy for people who have disappointed you in the past. <laughs> Um, and so we do, we need a lot of people. And that really goes back to this question of communication, right? That you brought up is like, how can I ask for support or pull in support in a way that, um, that feels genuine and within my skill set, um, that, you know, doesn't kickstart ego and hormones and feelings. Like I just need to be able to say, Hey, this is where I'm at and this is what I need. Can you help me with that? Right. Sometimes we pay for it and sometimes we don't have to. Um, but we need support. Um, having an active imagination sincerely just means um, asking what if. What if this didn't feel that hard? What if I could tackle this? What if there was a way to solve this problem, right? And what are all of the ways that can look? I, I think one of the most fun creative exercises when you're tackling a problem that's in front of you is brainstorming the most outrageous ways that you can move through this, the totally unachievable, otherwise unimaginable solutions. Because while often that can't happen, elements of that are really possible. And they're usually possible when we get to then brainstorm the support that we need. But <laughs> um, if we dream really big and we ask really great questions and we do best case scenario, worst case scenario, middle scenario, what if I was somebody else? Um, I don't know who's watching and I don't want to offend anybody, but given a conversation we were just having and the fact that this group is all women here, um, what if I was a man tackling this problem, right? What if I was a wealthy person tackling this problem? What if I was 20 years older and I was tackling this problem? How would I approach it then, right? Try that on for size and then come up with your, okay, here are some things that I didn't think about before. All right, so even if you do that, <laughs> uh, there's still probably a barrier. And sometimes that barrier is I don't have enough money, I don't have enough time, I practical elements are missing. But often the barrier is that we don't think we should or we don't think we can for some reason that is not our own. There is messaging out there from well-meaning people 
sometimes not so well-meaning people, but mostly well-meaning people, um, that have made us have our own internalized messages that we need to live a really small life. And that's what we want to challenge by just giving ourselves permission to tackle this however we want, however creatively. And that can be in the form of mantras or affirmations. I am enough. I am worthy. Um, it could be in the form of um, ha having somebody remind you of that, right? Or remind you what you're capable of, surrounding yourselves by certain people. I think this is a really nice community of holding each other up and saying like, we know you really, why wouldn't you do that? You totally deserve that. You deserve more money. You deserve time away. You deserve somebody to help you. You deserve to achieve. You deserve whatever it is, right? Um, and I think one of the biggest barriers for giving yourself permission is um, feeling guilt or shame around whatever is in front of you because you want to live in, in the predetermined um, path that was set out. So we sort of need to blow that idea up and just know that it's not true and that wasn't yours and, and do that self-reflection work in order to say, like, what do I want and how can I move through this? Um, so again, there's like, there's so much more I want to say, but, um, what I want to do now is really just think with the time we have left about, um, what, what weird and wild and simple, hacky things there are in the world that help us move through overwhelm because we all have them. We all have like, oh, you know this thing I do, but like I don't always tell people I do it, but like it actually does really help me. So we can sort of collectively brainstorm what those are because you can share them and learn from each other. Um, so, I, you know, starting with mine, it's switching to a straw top water bottle. That is a legitimate hack that I use that helps me be less overwhelmed, both because I stay hydrated and because I now have emotional attachment to this like really silly anatomy object. Um, well, how much time do we have? Perfect. Um, yeah, so I will fill in if we need to, but um, Laura. I get things out of my brain. Yeah. And just down. I give, I take tangible tasks yep. that need to be executed. Yeah. I put one by one on a post it note. Yep. And then I put them up on a wall yep. where either I see them and therefore don't have to remember them, or somebody else in my life sees them and can say, oh, I can do that laundry. Or I can unload the dishwasher. Yeah. It lets me not have to think about those things all the time because they're yeah. now on the wall. Mm -hmm. So one of the, like, the, the biggest elements of overwhelm is the mental load, right? It's that we're keeping track of so much up here that is not visible to anybody else. And so to-do list, post-it notes, some system of getting your thoughts out, your tasks out is gonna be super helpful for everybody. And the other thing that I, I think you're getting at, but I'm projecting, is having a sense of accomplishment. Taking the post-it note off the wall. Crumpling it up, throwing it in the garbage. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and so that act of, you know, throwing out a post-it note, crossing something off the to-do list can be really helpful. And for a lot of people that are really busy or don't have enough time, it's actually because we're probably doing too much. Like objectively, we're doing too many things. Um, and because we go at a pace that is, you know, could be questioned. That's another talk. Um, we often don't even celebrate the small victories in the day. And the other flip side of making your to-do list is making a to-done list, right? Like, what did, I, what did I just do in an hour? What did I get done today? What did I get done this week? Oh my gosh, I'm gonna cross everything off as I go because I already did it, but look what I already did, right? So that can also be really fulfilling and then self-motivating because you're charging your batteries just by saying, wait, I, I have a sense that I haven't accomplished anything. I have a sense that there's all this stuff up here, but actually like, look what, I, look what, look what we tackled. We're doing okay, me and my brain and my body. Yeah. Um, other, yeah. Mm -hmm. And each one is 30 minutes, and my Google Calendar looks absolutely absurd, but it, it does help, like, yep. seeing the to-done, and also it puts it in a time yeah. frame in your day, and that's 
nice. And also, if I'm like feeling so overwhelmed, I like take a big breath in, and like I do an audible sigh, and it's like, <sighs> and some people it's like, ah, and some people it's like, ah, you know. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you said two things that are both really important. <laughs> um, one is like time management. And the part that I want to draw out of that aspect of time management, um, and this is like a direct sort of what labor lesson. It's like, you know, the way I talk about it when I'm just talking to pregnant people um, is we, we call it the pregnant opportunity. So you have this really big task at hand. What are we going to like pull from this experience? And how we get through it is that we take this big, ah, I got to have a baby, this is really scary, and we break it up to really, really manageable elements. So in labor, you have a one minute contraction and then a very long break and then a one minute contraction and then maybe a shorter break, but you have breaks. Um, and so instead of saying, okay, I need to get through an hour, two hours, I need to have a baby, we're saying we're gonna do this one hard thing. So when we break up our tasks into time management and you know you're gonna go in with the energy to tackle that one task and then you get to step back, that's gonna like really help us stay present and just do the, th the next thing, right? I'm gonna do what's right in front of me at the moment. The other thing is such a core physiological way that we all need to be in our bodies and move through the world, especially when we're overwhelmed. And that's not just with breathing, but like combining breathing and vocalizing in some way. And this is like, it's so big, it's really like a huge concept because part of how we're taught to be, it's not just being independent, it's also being quiet. And, you know, if I'm stressed and I need to take a breath, I can do that really quietly. And it might make me feel like a little bit better, but making noise, which is very uncomfortable and I'll like be in un uncomfortable for all of us in a public space. Uh, <laughs> It's gonna make me feel way better, like way better, because I'm actually releasing all of these feelings of tension. But I, I am coming off maybe one of the most overwhelming weeks of my life. And <laughs> Yeah. But at the same time, like what I've learned is that it honestly just makes everything work because most of the time the people I work with are very kind and understanding and very sick people. And yeah. Sometimes I do need to just, you can be, like there's a level, I'm not just like come to work and be like a total mess, but like you do have to express where you're at because then no one is going to hear you. Yeah. No one is going to help you. And that is something, it's taking me a very hard time to learn. But one of the things is the woman I'm working for, she was like, Mm -hmm. like, I know it seems weird, but she's like, you'll be in your car, no dinner, whatever. She's just like, let it out. Yeah. And, and she's right, and it's like, it will be helpful. But the biggest thing is, is it's just express it. I need to be better about expressing my needs, my own needs. Yeah. Because I'm constantly taking care of other people's needs and forget, like, the people can help me. Like, I don't need to do everything. Mm -hmm. Or like whatever, like 
I yeah. was insane. Like, I am on, like, this, like, I am on thin ice in my own life. Like, I need you to help me with, like, the house stuff, pick up whatever it is that you do. And, like, he did it. And I guess we could just never ask. I also am very good at reading people's needs, but I know that, or I'm learning now that that's actually a skill and not something that a lot of people have. And so for me to expect that people can read my mind or feel me is totally not reasonable. Yeah. There's so much packed in. I know personally that you're reading Fair Play and that can really help. So like we can help people navigate Fair Play, but this is a great note to end on. And this is what I will say that I talk about all the time for people at different stages of their life, especially when people have little babies or have big projects that they're tackling and are feeling that um, very validating sense of there's too much on my plate. Um, so, okay, so the last thought when you're in that moment is Consider what it feels like when a friend or a loved one comes to you and says, I need your help. It usually feels really good because it means that they trust you and they have the safety to lean on you and you can show up for someone else. We forget that when we need to ask and we need to switch our perspective and remember that feeling, right? Not only are you doing something for yourself, but by asking for help, you're letting somebody in, which is gonna help them individually, selfishly, it's gonna help them, it's gonna strengthen your bond, and it's gonna strengthen your community, right? So it's like a very, it's a, it's a very big move. It's a very powerful move to ask somebody to step in and help you when you're, when you're overwhelmed. Yeah. Yeah. All right. I feel like we should wrap right on time. Thank you so much, everybody, for coming. And yeah, it's great. Thanks. Thank you so much, Ashley. Um, I hope this has been, uh, well, what's the, it's, uh, Whelming? I don't know what it has. Whelming. Whelming. <laughs> whelming. Not overwhelming. Not <laughs> underwhelming. Just the perfect amount of whelming. Um, we're so grateful to have had you sharing all of this and providing free therapy at Saxworks. Um, please go to saxworks.com, sign up for a complimentary day pass, come visit us, and um, fill out your sheets and uh, figure out how to take some more sips. Mm? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm. Uh, thank you so much. <laughs> Have a great day and uh, feel, feel good. Feel good, right? That's what, what else is there? Feel good. Feel good. Okay. okay. Feel good. Uh,